Hello guys. For this lecture, we're going to cover a couple more elements. We're going to first cover value and a whole bunch of terminology related to that. And then we'll cover color. So let's start off with value. Uh, first off, what is value? Well, it's the light and dark within an artwork. Basically, value is another word for shading. So here we have this work by Mark Rothko. And we would say this painting has a lot of dark values. You have dark reds and dark blues. Now values can also be created with lines. Like when we think about making values, lights and darks, we think about shading, smudging, like charcoal, graphite, or mixing paint. But a lot of times artists will have to rely on lines to make values. So here we have a few examples of this. When lines are very dense, like they are overlapping one another, that will convey a darker value than if the lines are loose. So here we have these three loose value scales. So a value scale is like a way an artist might study value. They might try out different techniques like we see here to see how to make it look lighter versus darker. So we have one with scribbles, one with lines, one where the lines overlap. And you can see up towards the top, that has a lighter sense of value than towards the bottom where the lines are more dense. Now we have particular terms for different ways you use line to make value. So hatching is when the lines are placed close to, together to convey value. So these lines are parallel, basically. So hatching, all the lines are going in the, in the same direction. There's no real overlap. So here we have this picture of this woman and you have all these series of straight lines. And when it comes to the background, it feels lighter than say the lines used in her hair. And that all relates to the density of the lines. Now, when it comes to hatching, they don't have to be perfectly straight. When you do hatching, you can make your lines curved, but the main thing is they're going in the same direction. They're not overlapping. Now, when the lines do overlap, like we see here, we call that cross hatching. So when you're relying on rather straight lines and they're overlapping, crisscrossing, we call that cross hatching. And it works the same way. Wherever the cross hatching is more dense, that conveys a darker value than where the lines are more loose. And here you could get the sense of, oh, your hatching doesn't have to be straight. If you look at Rembrandt, this is his self-portrait. If you look at his hair, you can see that his hatching is curved. It has a little bit of a swirl to it. So his cross hatching for his hair has a swirl to it to convey, oh, this is, he has curly hair. Another technique that's a little bit different is called stippling. So stippling is, works the same way as hatching and cross hatching in which the density impacts the value that's conveyed. Stippling, you're using dots. So you might to do stippling in a, say a drawing, you might be relying on a marker or a pen, and you're just making little dots. And where the dots are more loose, less dense, that makes a lighter value. On the sphere here, where the dots are very dense, that makes a darker value. You may have also heard of the term pointillism. And you might be wondering, well, what's the difference between stippling and pointillism? Pointillism, I like to make the difference, um, the difference of color for it. So if you're doing a painting and you're relying on color, I would say that's more of pointillism versus stippling. Like stippling is usually considered a drawing term. Pointillism is considered more of a painting term. The last technique I want to cover that relates to relying on line for value is scumbling. So scumbling is the use of erratic lines or scribbles to create values. And that has a much different feel than what we've seen before. Like all of these techniques, they all have their own sense of feeling or vibes that they put off when an artist uses them. So here, this feels kind of rough, or as the scumbling goes, or you might just call this scribbling. It just depends. But this was very rough, very loose, very energetic, very organic. If we look at stippling, this feels more calm, you could say, and more delicate. Like this feels very, very, very delicate for as the procedure goes. And when, if you've ever done stippling or pointillism, you know it's very tedious. It's a very uptight process because you're stuck with dots, <laughs> essentially. And then cross-hashing and hatching 
these are kind of um, in the middle of the road. Uh, you could make hatching or cross hatching feel kind of rough, or you could feel make it feel kind of slick here, in which all the lines are going in the same direction. This feels less rough than say this one, this piece by Rembrandt. So it all depends on how you approach the technique. Now, why bother with this? You know, if you are an artist, it's like, why not just smudge everything? You know, if you're working with pencil, why would you rely on hatching rather, and just rely on smudging the graphite or smudging the charcoal? Well, the reason artists have to learn stippling, cross hatching, scumbling, these techniques is there's a lot of processes where you are stuck with that. There is no smudging. There is no paint. So you can't blend in that sort of manner. You have to rely on line to make lights and darks. So a few examples of techniques or materials where you're stuck with lines for your values. Pen. Uh, you really can't smudge pen. I mean, you can, but it's going to look like a mess. With pen, you're stuck with lines and dots. Scratchboard. Uh, if you don't know what scratchboard is, you basically have this sheet of white paper and it has this black coating over it. And the process is you scrape away from this black coating. Well, if you're scraping stuff away, you're stuck with line, essentially. You also have metal point, which is your, it's like a pencil, but typically you're making lines with silver. And you can't really blend metal point. You can't blend silver. You can't smudge it. it. It's once you make that mark, it's there. And then a couple of others is engraving and etching. And these are we'll talk about these in the future. But you basically are cutting into a metal plate to make your design. There's there's no way you could smudge a metal plate to make a say a medium gray. So that's why this is kind of important to understand is there's a lot of art techniques that you have to do this if you want value. Let's go on to the more naturalistic, or I shouldn't say naturalistic, but the more smooth approach to value. So hatching, cross hatching, stippling, that leaves sort of this texture behind. Now, if you're painting, you're not stuck with line. You, you can blend your paint together to get various shades. When you're doing that to convey volume and to make something look naturalistic, very realistic, we call that chiaroscuro. So chiaroscuro is kind of a fancy word to describe the use of lights and dark values to convey volume. And typically this is referred to when we're talking about very naturalistic painting, like we see here by Vermeer. So here we have this milk made by Vermeer. This feels almost like a photograph in a way. And that's not an accident. When it comes to Vermeer, he actually used a very old photograph or, or camera type of device called a camera obscura for his painting. So we see that translated to his actual paintings. Like his paintings, you could say he copied photographs. He, he relied on this camera obscura to plan out his works. So we get, get this good sense of chiaroscuro, lights and darks because of that. So that's what that means. Now, another term that technically falls under the umbrella of chiaroscuro, but means something a bit more specific, is tenebrism. So tenebrism, you have this sense of volume, you have naturalistic shading. The big key factor here is tenebrism means extreme contrast in lights and darks. And typically, when this first popped up in painting, this was a reference to theater. So we see tenebrism pop up after the Renaissance in an art period called the Baroque, and they were all about the opera. They were all about theater. So the artists during that time decided to take that lighting that they saw when they went to the opera and apply it to their paintings to give them drama, to make them more dramatic. So here we have an example of that. We have this piece by Caravaggio. It's called For a Version on the Way to Damascus. Basically, you might be wondering what's going on here. <laughs> so we have this guy named Saint Paul. So we have a biblical story. So Saint Paul, he was basically persecuting the Christians. This is after the death of Christ and his resurrection. So he's persecuting the Christians. He goes to Damascus and on his way there, he encounters Jesus. <laughs> and there's this bright light. And he, from that event, 
actually goes blind from that bright light. So here we see him falling off his horse. He has gone blind. That's what's going on here. I know it's kind of weird. It's kind of confusing. A lot of people complained about this work looking like a stable accident. Like if you if you didn't have the title, you would assume that this is someone in a stable that's fallen off the horse and their servants like, oh well. <laughs> so there's a bit of confusion here. So that's sort of the downside with Tenebrism is you do remove the background. So when your background is all black, you you have no context as far as location, as far as place. So that can be problematic, but artists would still do this anyway. So a lot of times it would turn out much better than this as far as what is going on. This is just one example in which the Tenebrism may have actually made this work more confusing and removed some of the clarity of what's happening. Here. Now, you also have contrast. So we talked about contrast with tenebrism. Contrast can refer to more than, say, value. Contrast is just the difference between visual elements. So it can refer to, say, rough versus smooth, bright versus dark. It can refer to a thin line versus a fat line. So it's just the difference between visual elements. So here we have another example of tenebrism. We have this painting called The Nightmare, and once again, you have a very, very dark background. You have the strong contrast in light and dark. It looks like this scene is filled with a, a spotlight. And when you have high contrast, the artwork really pops, and it can help with the mood. So the high contrast here kind of amps up the eerie mood of this work. So here we have this woman. She's basically asleep. She's having a nightmare, and there's basically this demon on her chest, implying that that's the reason that she's having these nightmares here. Now, when you have a lot of darkness, that will convey an eerie mood. So if you have a lot of darkness, typically that makes your works not feel so calm and comfortable and easy to approach. Here we have a work by Sugimoto. And this is quite different. This, you, we have low contrast as far as the values go. Now, when you have low contrast within works in general, they're not going to be as eye-catching. So they're not going to have as much visual pop. That said, they will be easier on the eyes. You'll, you're going to have a more serene vibe coming from these type of works. So here we have this seascape, Sea of Japan. This is basically a drawing. And this is very relaxing to look at, unless you're scared of the ocean. But maybe not. But I like the ocean. You like I, some of you might like the ocean. For me, when I look at this, this is relaxing to stare at, at least for a little bit. So let's move on to color. So once again, we're going to have a lot of terminology off the get go. And the first thing I want to cover is color mixing. So there's two approaches to color mixing. There's additive where you are relying on light for your colors. And these are things like art that's on computer screens, TV, smartphones. So you're relying on a screen or a projector. You're relying on light for your colors. And for additive color mixing, when you mix all the colors together, you get white. So white light technically has all the colors within it. And if you want a good example of this, you can just take a prism or a crystal, put it up to the sunlight, and you will see prisms, or little, these, these little rainbow specks on the wall. And basically that crystal is fragmenting the white light into different colors. So that's why I mean like white light has all the colors in it. That's just how it is with additive color mixing. So try to color mixing is what you're gonna counter typically if you take an art class. So you're relying on pigments, you're relying on paint, you're relying on ink or pencil, pastel, things that have pigments used to make their different colors. Now with subtractive color mixing, when you mix all the colors together on your palette, you're going to end up with gray or sometimes a brown. If you want a neat little test, like if someone is saying they're a great artist, that they're great at mixing colors together, a great painter, one way to test to see if that's actually the case is ask them to make gray with colors. If someone's really good at color mixing, they can make gray 
with their palette, with their colors, without using black and white. So let's talk a little bit more about added color. Added color, the primaries for that are red, green, and blue. So a primary color is used to make all of the other colors. So if you wanted to make yellow, cyan, or magenta, you need to have red, green, and blue. And that is labeled as RGB. So if you hear the term RGB, especially around graphic designers, they're referring to added color mixing. They're referring to red, green, blue. So if you wanted yellow, that's a secondary color. So secondary colors are made from primary colors. If you mix red and green together, you get yellow. I know that's kind of weird, but that's just how it works with light. If you want cyan, you mix blue and green together. If you want red and blue, you mix, you get magenta from that. And if you blend everything together, all those colors, you get white in the center. Now with subtraction color mixing, if you're using pigments, your primaries and secondaries are different. So for subtractive color mixing, the traditional primary colors, what you probably were taught in school, if you took our class, is yellow, blue, and red. The secondary colors, is green, orange, and purple. So green, that's when you mix yellow and blue. If you want purple, you mix blue and red together. So that's a secondary color. A term you may never ever hear again, <laughs> maybe you might see it on the test, is tertiary colors. So tertiary colors is basically when you take a secondary and a primary and mix those together. So for example, if you mix yellow and green, you get lime green. If you mix red and purple, you get burgundy. Now, when it comes to subtractive color mixing, the true primary colors are actually not yellow, blue, and red. They're actually magenta, cyan, and yellow. If you are stuck to just three colors, technically you cannot make all the other colors if you are just using red, yellow, and blue. If you wanted to make every other color, you can possibly conceive of, for the most part. You have to have magenta, cyan, and yellow. That's why your printers, if you ever bought printer ink or had to change it out, you might have wondered, why does my printer not use blue, yellow, and red? Like I was taught in school, why does you, why, why is it magenta, yellow, and cyan? Well, those are the true primary colors. If you use red, yellow, and blue, you can't make as many colors with that set. So for example, if you've ever taken art class and a lot of times you're given a color wheel assignment in which you have, you're giving something like this and everything's blank. You have to fill everything in with color. One thing you'll notice a lot of times when people do this assignment and they're just given one yellow, one blue, one red is they can't make violet and they can't make lime green. And that's because yellow, red, and blue are not true primary colors. If you're just stuck with three and you want to make violet and you want to make lime green, you want to make all the colors, you have to use this set here. We have a couple of triangles here, and this is a great example of what I mean by cyan, magenta, yellow versus red, blue, and yellow or as primaries. When you look at the triangle on the left, you'll notice those colors are more pure. They're not as muddy. They're not as dark. They're more bright and vibrant. The one, the triangle on the right where you have red, blue, and yellow, you have a lot more mud within the color mixing. So it's not as pure. It's not as true as cyan, magenta, and yellow as far as making accurate colors. Now we have some more terms. You have a thing called saturation, which is the purity of a color. So it's a color that's very saturated is very pure. A color that's unsaturated is very impure. And when a color is pure, we call that a hue. So a hue is the color straight up from the tube. You've not mixed anything with it. So that's a hue. And saturation goes down as you add more and more to it. So there's various things you can add to a color to manipulate it. Uh, so you have white, gray, and black. When it comes to art, those are actually not considered color. So sometimes when you take an art class, you might be asked, is white a color? If you are an artist, you should say no. You might be asked if black is a color. 
If you're an artist, you should say no. Those are the things that you add to color to manipulate them. So a tint is basically you take a hue, in this case red, and you add white to it. A shade is when you add black to your hue, and tone is when you add gray to a hue. So a tint is more like a pastel, a shade gets darker, and a tone really, when you add gray to a tone, it really impacts its saturation. It becomes far more muted, far more uh, less intense. Now, one other term you might hear if you take, say, painting, is a thing called an open palette. So a palette is the thing where an artist mixes their colors on, and an open palette basically implies the artist is using all of their colors. So here we have an example of an artwork where the person, probably a kid with some talent, used all of the colors that they had. Now in this case, it looks like they're using markers. So they're using red, blue, or pink, orange, green, light blue, like all these very vibrant colors. So the more colors you bring into a work, the more busy it can feel. And it becomes more and more difficult to make these works balanced visually, like easy on the eyes to look at when you bring in more and more colors. Now, sometimes an open palette works just fine. In this case, I'd be like, it's okay. It's kind of hard to stare at for a pro prolonged period of time. There's ways to work around that. Now, one way to work around that is using a restricted palette. So a restricted palette is when you have strong co control over the colors that you use. And in this instance, for example, if you look at this photograph and imagine that this was a drawing or a painting, this is a very controlled palette. So with this painting, we have blues and mainly greens, maybe a little bit of brown here and there. But in general, if I were to paint this, I would have to have a restricted palette to make this painting look, or make this photograph look the way it is in my painting. So that's restricted. You're not using the whole palette, like you're not using all the colors in a piece. You're just using a few. Now, when you mix colors, one other way you can drastically lower saturation, besides adding gray to your paint, is mixing a thing called complementary colors together. So complementary colors with art means colors opposite of each other on the color wheel. So if we look at the color wheel, here we have blue and orange. If you look at a color wheel, you'll notice that those are opposite of one another. So when you mix those together, you get a color that has less saturation. And this is a very common technique. Uh, most artists usually, when they want to lower the saturation of color, they don't really rely on gray too often. They will rely on the complementary color to lower the saturation of a blue or of an orange. Now, works that have complementary colors have high contrast. And in this case, we have the screen. We got lots of blues and lots of oranges, technically a little bit of yellow. Now, because of the high contrast, this makes the screen more alarming to look at. There's a lot of energy to it, but at the same time, it, it kind of gives the eeriness and the, the fear factor a punch because of the contrast within it. It's, it's kind of weird. You, you might not expect that when you use opposites together, but that can happen depending on what is in your artwork. Another example where an artist might want high contrast with color, they're relying on complementary colors. So here we have the Viking, the Minnesota Viking logo, and their logo is basically yellow with purple. A lot of times you'll see that with sport team logos is they'll go towards complementary colors or with their outfits on the field. That The reason they'll choose that is it's very eye-catching to whether, like if it's your outfits, it's very eye-catching to your fellow teammates. If you're doing a logo, you want it to be eye-catching because you're trying to sell merch. So that's the impact with complementary colors. If you use opposites, is it has a strong visual punch. And it could be something easy on the eyes, very appealing like we see here, or it could be used to emphasize a creepy factor like we see within the screen. Now let's talk about different color combinations. Now technically complementary colors, you could say that's a color scheme, uh, but here, we have a monochromatic color scheme. So that is when the artist uses just one color 
within an artwork, plus black and white. So here we have the Cathedral in Rouen by Monet, and the main color here is blue. So he's just using blue, adding white to it. He doesn't look like he's used black at all. When you have monochromatic works, typically these works are very calm. They have a serene vibe to them. And part of that is due to the restricted palette. So a monochromatic color scheme has a very restrictive palette. So th these types of paintings tend to be easy on the eyes as well. Then you have analogous color schemes. So analogous colors are basically colors right beside each other on the color wheel. So he, here we have a work by Van Gogh called Sunflowers. And when we look at the color wheel and look at the painting, we can see, okay, we got greens, light greens, we got yellows, some oranges in there. So this feels very balanced. Technically, there's a little bit of blue in there, but in general, the bulk of the color is green, yellow, and orange for the most part. So when you have a clear cut color scheme, that can make your works feel balanced, especially when you keep on adding more and more variety to the colors. Having a color scheme will make your work not feel too busy or too chaotic. Now we have complementary color schemes as well, so that we kind of covered this already. This color scheme, you're using colors opposite of each other on the color wheel. So here we have another example of that by Monet. This is Row of Poplars. And in general, the main color scheme here is blue with orange. So this has quite a lot of visual pop. It it's not, has a nice sense of warmth, but also has a nice sense of cool colors within it. Then you have a thing called split complementary color schemes. So this is when you have, you know, say the artist chooses one color. Rather than doing the color opposite of each of it on the color wheel, they choose colors adjacent to the opposite. So here we have this painting with these apples, the drainer, I guess you call it. <laughs> I think it's called a drainer. I had to look it up again. That's red. But rather than relying on green, for the other color, the artist says you relied on this teal blue and this lime green as the other major colors for their painting. So that's a split comp complementary color scheme. Then you have triadic color schemes. So this is called triadic because when you connect the dots between the colors used, you get a triangle at the end. So this is where you use colors evenly spaced around the color wheel. So here we have this work by Jasper Johns. It's called Target. It's using green, orange, and purple. Well, when we look at the color wheel here and connect the dots between green, orange, and purple, you see it forms a triangle. So that's triadic. Now, this type of painting has a lot of energy to it, but at the same time, it feels balanced because there is thought behind what colors are used. So here's another example of a painting with a triadic color scheme. This is a piece by Pierre Mondrian, composition with red, blue, and yellow. And remember, black and white are not colors. Red, yellow, and blue are colors. So that's a triadic color scheme. If we connect the dots, we have a triangle. We have colors evenly spaced on the color wheel being used to this painting. The last major color scheme I want to cover is a tetradic color scheme. So that's when you use two sets of complementary colors. And when you connect the dots here, you get a tri uh, not triangle, <laughs> a rectangle in this instance. So here we have a work by Gauguin. Basically, we have a scene of Tahiti here, and his colors are red, yellow, violet, and green. So the red here, we have red plus uh, pink, which is red with white in it. We got greens for the grass. We got yellows for the trees and the sky. We got purple here and there in the mountains and the clouds and a little bit in the animals. So that's a tetradic color scheme. So this feels more complex to look at because you got more going on. You got more colors, but because of that color scheme, it feels quite balanced. Now let's talk about the effects of color on mood, on the vibe of the work. So you can take a color and use it in a symbolic way. So here we have a work by Picasso called The Tragedy, and this is actually uh, from a series of paintings where it's called the blue paintings. And this is done during a time basically for Picasso. He was financially in really rough shape, but on top of that, the, the real big thing is a good friend of his committed suicide. So when dealing with this stuff, you know, he, 
He definitely felt like crap. He definitely was sad. So he did a series of paintings where it's filled with blue colors. So by using just blue here, this emphasizes the sadness within this work, within this piece. So here, the color blue is being used in a symbolic, personal manner. Now, some color symbolism is based off of culture versus, say, one personal um, inst uh, experience. So example of a color being symbolic and being heavily reliant on culture is purple. So purple, if you were in ancient Rome, purple was a color associated with the emperor, with the Roman emperor. So if you were back in the Roman Empire, if you saw someone with purple on, that would imply that they had a connection to the emperor. So that was his color. Um, technically, it was illegal for common citizens to wear purple. Now, people broke the laws anyways, but technically that color was reserved for the for the Roman emperor and his family or people very closely connected to him. Uh, and the, we might be wondering why. <laughs> why out of all the colors is purple associated with the emperor? Well, the reason that's the case is purple was it, like a, the purple, to get the kind that the emperor would have worn, that would have been insanely, insanely expensive purple to make. Now, there, there are other ways to make purple, but to have the purple that the emperor would wear, that would be insanely pricey. Uh, like it was a very tedious process to get that purple. Basically, the purple used for the emperor's clothing would, would, came, would have come from mollusks. You'd, it'd take forever to get enough colorant to make something purple for the emperor. So very time consuming. You were also limited as far as like where these mollusks are at. So it was all about money in a way. <laughs> like like the reason they chose purple was it was the most expensive color that could, they could get their hands on. So that's why they associated with the emperor. You'll see this throughout history in which kings, queens, emperors, the way they convey their power is by wearing stupidly expensive stuff. So things with very expensive colorants or wearing things with embroider gold embroidery in it. So like that's the common thing you'll see throughout like fashion for kings, queens, emperors, things like that. Let's move on from like symbolism. So when it comes to colors and symbolism, sometimes it's personal, like we saw with Picasso. Sometimes it's kind of cultural based, like we saw with purple and the Roman emperor. But here we're going to be a bit more open-ended, or it's just how colors act and convey a mood in general. So if you have a work with lots of pastels and light colors, these types of paintings feel more calm and serene. So if you say you have a friend and you know that they're going through a rough time and you want to give them a nice painting to, to look at in the morning before they start off their rough day, you would probably want to do a painting with lots of pastels like we see here by Giorgio O'Keefe. So here we have the road to Pradernal and we got pinks, we got light yellows, we got blues that are kind of you could tell white's been added to this blue, so it's a bit more on the pastel side. You do have some black trees, but in general, the dominant color are pastels. And this is very calm and serene to look at. It's easy on the eyes because of that. Now, colors that are minimal can also emphasize a mood. So we saw that with Picasso, which he just used blue, and that emphasized the sadness here. Um, in this instance, we have brown. So this old artist, Goya, this is called the Bewitched Man, he's relying on brown and just brown alone to emphasize the eerie vibe within this piece. Uh, like you have goats standing in the background, you have a goat demon, you have a man covering his mouth with bulging eyes. So due to the lack of color, this gives this work an eerie Vibe. And browns in general, like browns and grays tend to, well, grays technically are not a color, but like brown here is, browns are kind of a dirty color, a grody color. It's not something you associate with cleanliness. So that's also being used within this piece here. Now, the complete opposite, here we have a work by Jeff Koons called Play-Doh, and you have a whole bunch of different colors. So when you use a whole bunch of different colors, that can make your work feel more light 
lighthearted. It can make it feel um, more approachable versus this in which the, the lack of color or just the use of brown makes this kind of creepy and unsettling to look at. This is far more charming, a little bit more approachable. I mean, I'm not sure you want a giant statue of a bunch of Play-Doh or work, something that looks like Play-Doh piled up on one another. But still, this is fun. This is childlike. When you have bright colors and lots of different colors mixed together, this conveys youth. This conveys playfulness. So depending on how many colors you have, it can be kind of childish in nature, which might be what you want. But that's not always the case. So here we have very bright colors. We have a lot of colors, but this is not playful. <laughs> this is not, this, this is not convey youth or children within this piece. This is actually kind of alarming to look at, but it also has a lot of energy to this. So here we have this work by Rusolo called The Revolt. So the use of bright reds and bright yellows, it implies fire, it implies energy. So this, like how you use colors and what you're depicting will drastically change the impact of the color. You know, this pile of Play-Doh, which technically this is a metal sculpture. It's just sculpted in a way that looks like Play-Doh, but technically it's a massive amount of metal. But due to the coloring, it looks like Play-Doh. It looks fun, childish. This, far different. So colors can really switch for as how they're going to impact your mood or impact the vibe of a painting. So the last way an artist might use color is, is conceptually. So it might not be used to be symbolic for something in particular. Like when we think of blue, we think of sadness. When we think of purple, you might think of royalty or the emperor if you history. If you think of green, you might think of nature. If you think of yellow, you might think of cowardice or pee. <laughs> But in this instance, the color is being chosen to convey an idea. Uh, so here we have another work by Gauguin. This is Vision After the Sermon. So one thing artists would do during this time, so, so Gauguin worked around the same time as Van Gogh. One thing that was popular was in France, you basically kind of had your version of the Amish in France, and they had their own little community. And artists would come to this community, do paintings of the people there, and they were very religious, like, like the Amish are. So here we have Gauguin doing a painting after these, this group of people have gone to church. They left and they just listened to a sermon. And now they're apparently having a vision. So here you have them all gathered together. And to convey that they're having a vision with an angel and a man wrestling. So this is referencing a biblical story related to uh, Jacob wrestling the angel. But to convey that these women are experiencing a vision, he's relying on this bright red orange in the background. That's conveying that something supernatural is happening here. So here it, it's being used in a symbolic manner, kind of, but not like in the way we think of it. It's more to promote an idea than do a color that's symbolic to a culture or to, to himself. It's just there to convey, oh, these people are having a vision, that, that something supernatural is going on in their, in their head. So that's all I have for today's lesson. If you have any questions or concerns, remember, email me. I check it all the time. Um, you can also text me if you have an emergency of some sort, and I'll let you go.